Hello, my name is Rita Valenti, and I am the host of the Public Health Pulse podcast series. We are so happy to be interviewing Cara Page, Edgar Rivera Colon, Rob Wallace, scientist extraordinaire, Lara Germanis, physician and author of the People CDC External Pandemic Review, Dr. Sal Sandoval, practicing public health in the Valley of Southern California, John V. Devashi, medical student, and Tamika Middleton, who brings it all home as the managing director of the Women's March with We Can't Reform Our Way Out of This. Welcome to the exciting Public Health Pulse podcast series. Good morning, Kara Page. It is so wonderful to see you. But before I introduce you. Uh, yes. I want to give uh, give you and Erica Woodland thanks and gratitude for putting together and writing this glorious enlightened book, Healing Justice Lineages, Dreaming at the Crossroads of Liberation, Collective Care and Safety. And yes. I wanted to share with everyone that's listening today just a short section uh, from the beautiful invocation in the book. Um, We ask for protection, clarity, courage, humility, and to remain steadfast in our community for total revolution. May we be willing to sacrifice, offer, and give up all that holds us back from the collective dream of our ancestors to take this journey through time and space, to radically listen, to find our people and commit to the work of collective liberation to transmute fear and domination. May we come to know and remember over and over again the abundance of wisdom available to us, to realize our true destiny, our inheritance, to be in right relationship with creative energy in everything around us, to birth a new world. Uh, What a what a beautiful invocation. And I want to share with y'all uh, Kara Page is a Black queer feminist, cultural memory worker, and organizer that I've had the privilege to know for many, many years. Uh, for 30 years, she has organized with LGBTQI and uh, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color liberation movements in the U.S. and Global South at the intersections of racial, gender, and economic justice, healing justice, and transformative justice. She is co-founder of Healing Histories Project, a network of abolitionist healers and healthcare practitioners, researchers, community members, and more who are engaged in building solidarity to interrupt harmful systems of care in the medical industrial complex. As mentioned, uh, Kara is the co-author with Erica Woodland of Healing Justice Lineages, Dreaming at the Crossroads of Liberation, Collective Care and Safety now available at, in, in a book. Kara, welcome. Uh, Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you, Rita Valenti. One of my mentors, <laughs> friends, peers, all the things. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's get to it. I mean, there's a whole book on healing justice. And even that, you know, asks almost as many questions as it explores answers to. Um, That's right. But I want you to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, for folks that may not be familiar, uh, what is healing justice? How did it come about? It's historic roots. And what does this mean in this moment of great transitions? Yes, thank you. Well, I will start with, thank you so much. The invocation was beautifully read by you. And it is my honor uh, to have a co-collaborator, Erica Woodland, and the many other writers in the book. This really is an anthology. We interviewed over 100 people, um, including yourself, Rita Valenti, as as co-founder of Kindred Southern Healing Justice Collective, of course, as a core leadership member, and then, of course, as an abolitionist. Uh, a nurse, comrade, organizer in the work who's deeply inspired me. Um, so healing justice really is a re-emergence of what we believe has been a political lineage that has carried on since colonization and slavery. Mm-hmm. So to understand what are our 
collective care strategies that have allowed us to survive attempted genocide, right, of our peoples. Mm -hmm. So in particular, we say healing justice is a political strategy that seeks to intervene Mm -hmm. on generational trauma Mm -hmm. from colonization, slavery, oppression, systemic Mm -hmm. oppression, Mm -hmm. that will build collective power towards resistance. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by that? It actually centralizes the role of healers, the role of health practitioners, the role of cultural workers who are holding at the front lines collective care, collective grief, generational trauma. And it understands that we, in our leadership and in our praxis, actually have a role towards building power and collective strategy around care that is liberatory, that is rooted in a liberatory practice that doesn't repeat violent harm and abuses that the medical industry has allowed, permitted, because the medical establishments in this country have been so deeply entrenched in capitalism and colonization in their birth, since their birth, <laughs> right? So how do we as practitioners not re-perpetuate harm and abuse, but actually come through a liberatory um, practice that reimagines what care can look like when it's not mired in a hierarchy of whose bodies are expendable, whose bodies are worth caring for, and whose bodies are only here to reproduce for the wealthy elite or take care of the wealthy elite instead of taking care of ourselves and each other. I love that. I I love that. And, you know, in the current landscape that we're experiencing, which is, you know, really been heightened by this pandemic, it's exposed an undercurrent of eugenics, right? At the at the altar of business as usual. Uh, Could you, you know, talk a little bit about uh, those connections and the connections with uh, abolition and generational trauma uh, that you've already referenced? Um, My pleasure. Mm. (laughs) My desire, my whole political work. Uh, really has been rooted in an anti-eugenic practice, as you know, Rita, because we are deeply aligned on that journey. Um, When we're looking at the massive incarceration and institutionalization of Black and brown bodies, in particular in the South in this country, um, that has built its capital on the incarceration of our people, what we are also looking at is two major forces. Mm -hmm. One, the ideology of population control, Mm -hmm. which very much stems from this concept, this idea from the 18th century that people of color's fertility is the root cause of environmental degradation. And that belief system, right, is what justifies war, (laughs) justifies massive incarceration, justifies controlling communities that are perceived as being dangerous (laughs) um, or consuming um, natural resources. When what we're really talking about is actually war and capitalism that are the root cause of an environmental degradation. Mm -hmm. But this population control ideology has been used to mask and justify reasoning um, to control and um, kill our communities. Next to that is eugenics, right? Mm -hmm. This ideological belief put out by a white Christian supremacist ableist lens from the you know, 18th century, again, deeply rooted in Christian colonization, is this understanding or belief that um, that some genetic materials are more valuable than others. And that in this uh, global context, that Black and brown bodies are perceived as being less than human and that we are literally only reproducing for powers of white wealth white supremacy and capitalism, um, or we should be um, exterminated. That goes across other communities, queer and trans, disabled Mm -hmm. communities, sex workers, incarcerated people, that if we are not somehow participating in the global capital, then we um, should be literally removed, but that we're actually perceived as Black and brown people as being um, have a having a predilection based on our genetics to being criminals, to being dangerous, um, right? And so that belief system is deeply embedded in everything, 
Right. That is eugenics at its core. The the literal belief that you can you that that states have the right, state governments have the right to um, create violent um, systems that will control and remove our bodies because they perceive us as causing danger um, and consumption of society. You know, and we see this everywhere. And in fact, the reality is exactly the flip. This notion. That's right. Of of being a burden to society, not being, uh, n- not producing for the, f- uh, for society is That's actually right. re- reverse of what the reality is. Yes. I mean, for the essential workers in the society exactly. that are enriching uh, a capitalist class, right? Um, yes. It and the narrative now, is especially you know, with an ongoing. Uh, pandemic that's still with us, it it doesn't appear to be necessarily as virulent as it was initially, but is still there. Um, uh, This acceptance that uh, a certain certain sections of the population are disposable. Exactly. That's right. That's right. And if our care system is rooted in that, then what is what is care? And and if healthy the, the the determinants of what healthy is is rooted already in a racist, ableist, homophobic, transphobic lens of well, these people are already shouldn't exist, or they're already less than. So care is not as needed because they already come broken. This is what <laughs> these are the this is the analysis and a fear based agenda that perpetuates continued harm through scientific racism, ableism, and medical um, belief systems that still diagnose us, still preserve you know preserve this idea that we are less than human from jump, so that we only can be an experiment or our bodies could only be exploited. It doesn't start from a place of care. It starts from a place of exploitation. Right. So how do we uplift, break through this, this idea? And I mean, I want to give respect to Barbara Ehrenreich, right? Um, uh-huh. Who, who yeah. brought the term medical industrial complex um, in the late 70s, early 80s. The na- the year is escaping me. Um, but that, that read on the constructs of the medical industry, right, as a, as a, capitalist system used solely for the profit. That's like right. Care is only about the profit of people, not about care for people. And then you infuse that with a racist, ableist you right. know, lens. It, it, it begs the question, what then will we do to reimagine and erase the mistruths and mythologies based in this healthcare system? It's entrenched with lies. That yeah, that is so powerful. I remember Bar- Barbara Ehrenreich's book, The Empire right. of Healthcare, uh, Private Profits, and something. I've actually, yes. I-, I think I've given away that book a half a dozen times. Yes, and I never get it back, and I don't know, I no. don't know if it's still in print. But you know, you were hitting hitting on something by describing this landscape where. Yeah. Care has become a commodity. It is. Where uh, people are simply uh, a, a virtual way to extract profits That's for right. a massive industry. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, on one side of it, if you actually have any access to care. And then right. on the other side of it, just denial of care. Right? That's I right. Mean, exactly. exactly. You know, we've got this situation now with the end of the public health emergency where some be- mm. somewhere between 4 and 15 million people are going to lose Medicaid, That's right. uh, which was uh, inadequate and unequal to begin with, right? Yes. But even eliminating that, it just says, you know, uh, you're not worth it, you know, if, if your income is low. And then certainly in places like Georgia and the South, Kara, where so much of your heart and this book is, it is. Dead, the political home. That's right. So, so That's sorry. Right. It is 
Um, it is the political home, the South. It is, it has been our compass. When we look at generations of care workers, um, in particular, I like to lift up birth workers, right? Because the tradition of birth work as a revolutionary strategy, because literally during slavery, it was birth workers who were the 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 healers and the root workers that literally survived next generations by literally birthing or choosing to abort. And then here we are in this moment, re you know, reasserting our rights again for birth care, birthing dignity. Who's at the front lines? Who's being incarcerated? Who's being who's being threatened for incarceration? Is again birth workers. And the particular arc of the history of birth work in the South, when Northern doctors and Northern white doctors and nurses came down and stole traditions from Black and Indigenous birth workers in the fifties and sixties, and used licensure massive licensure, knowing that there was such a high rate of illiteracy because what, during slavery, no one was learning to read. It was seen as an assault on plantation society. So even though we still were, right, underground, but uh, but the, the level of illiteracy allowed for white Northern doctors and nurses to come, and in some cases, Black nurses, who mm. were asked to return to their Southern roots and help to criminalize. Yeah. Their black birth worker community, and in some cases, their great grandmamas, their aunties, right, who had literally birthed them, and they're suddenly having having to turn and say, "We need to license you, and yeah. we need to make sure that what you're doing is legitimate and viable." as a birth worker and they're sitting there saying, but you took all of our tradition and re-stratified it in the North and now you're bringing it back to us and telling us we're not professional enough to do it. Here we are, right? It's a perfect arc of understanding the criminalization of traditions inside of the profit for industry of the medical industry. That is so amazingly clarifying what you just said. There, there's another terrific book. I mean, you, you're you're referencing so much history. You know, it's yes, called yes. Rockefeller Medicine Man. Which, yes, thank you. You know, was yes. the whole idea of professionalizing along with what you were saying, right? That's right. White Christian male standards of care. That's right. And if if that wasn't the standard, then you were uh, apt to be exploited, dismissed, or indeed murdered. Uh, oh, that's right. You know, so. And I want to say this partnership with you, with the Kindred Southern Healing Justice Collective, when we began in the early 2000s, right, looking at how do allopathic medical health practitioners who might not necessarily only believe in a Western model of care, but are coming through a Western state model or or private privatized model of care, right. want to work with healers. Again, let's look at the Southeast in particular as a region that for centuries, um, I believe, has survived because we have been deeply connected to our traditional roots of care and healing by way of our, inc our ancestral traditions of African, Latinx, indigenous, right? That persevered beyond colonization. But here we are in the 21st century, looking each other in the eyes saying, how do we build across false notions of care that don't allow for partnerships between allopathic medicine and other, not alternative, but other real traditions of care that are ancestral how do we imagine ways to build integrative care models that do not decentralize one over the other? And remember at the U.S. Social Forum, when we were presented by doctors who said, well, you can't have a That's heart right. surgeon work with a Reiki master. And we said, why the hell not? I mean, why are we not here looking at the energetic psychic imprints of oppression and how that has deeply impacted how we are going to take care of our people? And so working with different kinds of traditions allows you to go beyond just the science of medicine, but actually into the spirit. <laughs> that is exactly the word I was thinking of. Was Come on. Th the spirit, the yes. spirit of humanity, That's the interconnectedness right. of humanity. Yes. You know, as a healthcare provider, and I was just chatting with Trap about this, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot, to my way of thinking, separate health from human relationship, right? That's right. We have to build these relationships, which sort of brings me 
to picking your brain on, okay. on what you've already been introducing is how do yes. we build these relationships That's and right. how do we share and actually discuss you know what is the vision that healers and healthcare providers yes. can can manifest uh, yes. together to build a trusted community rooted scientifically honest yes you know, system part. Of public uh, public health and healing, you know, and and one last thing about that, right? Mm-hmm. I, I remember the 2010 social forum and that whole question of the Western docs, right, and how that uh, how that showed uh, an ignorance about yes. what is actually not only possible but necessary at this That's point. Right. Um, That's right. And so there's also been a commodification of mm-hmm. healing justice, right? Yes. As another way to to escape getting to the vision that we share. And I wanted to to ask you, Kara, to to share talk about how we build that relationship. That's great. That's yeah. fantastic. So, yeah. and I want to clarify because if you look up healing justice, you might come up with a reformist uh, politic um, because of the co-optation, or let's say. Because people maybe didn't know we would what we were doing in the South, right? Okay, right. Um, but if you if you look, healing justice has been attached to some reformist political orgs, or can we say they're political? Let's say reformist organizations across there the country yeah. that are working with police yeah. around how to care for trauma from incidences of policing from the perspective of the survivor and the cop who may have caused the harm. That's unfortunate that they took healing justice, call it something else, because that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about an abolitionist praxis that is not about reforming, nor is it about colluding with the state. So we have been deeply invested in two parts through the Kindred Southern Healing Justice Collective work. And then for me, I've sort of sectioned off into some other projects, as you know, the Healing Histories Project and Changing Frequencies. You're doing a lot of work on two things. One, politicizing the role of healers, healthcare providers. How do they feel empowered to, to... intervene, interrupt, intercept on harm and abuse within their medical establishments? How do they know how to assess the risk of the conditions they are responding to and not to do it in isolation, but actually build power with the communities they're working with or other providers that they are in alignment with to say, we must hold this institution accountable for the safety and the survival of our communities that are being the most harmed and are the most vulnerable to these abuses, right? So there's that piece of really the politicization of providers. Um, and inside of that, I include the crossover, the, the intersection of looking at different traditions of care, reimagining what care is outside of state-defined ideologies that we've already established as racist, ableist, and so and classes, right? But then there's this other role. How are we going to actually uproot the establishments we're challenging? Absolutely. So, and how do we not re-perpetuate violence through a medical lens? So here we are, you and I, many of us who came together in partnership with Project South and the whole collaboration of, of a campaign to shut down the Irwin Detention Center, right, in, in Southern Georgia. That was catalyzed by a Black nurse, Dawn Wooten, who had to stand up and say, I will no longer collude with the harmful abuses of how incarcerated detained people are being treated during COVID and then unveiling the sterilization abuse that have been going on for years on detained people at the facility at in Irwin County. So it took her as a catalyst. It took years of political trust and organizing inside of campaign work led by Southern-based people of color organizations fighting for abolition, right, and the decarceration of our people. And then it took some of the work Healing Justice had been doing in the South, Kindred in particular, but other 
conversations and organizations like Equal Health, Campaign Against Racism, that has been fighting for equitable care inside of an anti-racial capitalist lens around the globe. And we came together with different practitioners, including Dr. Harriet Washington, who's held the entire system of reproductive health and debunked the myth that Dr. Marion Simmons wasn't a racist, violent person and not the father of gynecology, right? Amen. We brought those kinds of people together to say, how will we build solidarity Mm -hmm. and write a statement that one critiques the collusion of providers thinking they are not a part of the system Mm -hmm. of a racist, violent, massive incarceration system in this country? And how will they be dismissed, disrupt, interrupt the actions that these state systems are taking to violate, control, and condemn our people, right? So not removing the role of a provider somehow is different from inside prison versus outside. They can still perpetuate the same kind of harm. So we held that practitioner accountable who was committing sterilization abuse on hundreds of detained people. Mm -hmm. We also work with abolitionists therapists who came to support the survivors who had experienced harm and abuse inside of the detention center, who had experienced sterilization abuse and didn't know where to turn. Right. Right. And so that is the responsibility we still hold in terms of generational trauma and understanding that as providers, we are also at the front lines of responding to trauma, not only from the incident of incarceration, but the incident says of harm and abuse over centuries of colonization and slavery. That is politicalization. That is exactly exactly what we're talking about. Understanding the structures of, of the, of that we are working inside of. Right. What is the present moment that we're experiencing with mass incarceration, with massive detention? And what is the future that's that right. What is the future? To build. What is the yes. vision yes. that we share? And uh, we could, I mean, you know. We could you, go on forever, but <laughs> but because of who you are and who I see elders, if I may be so bold to say, elders <laughs> in the movement that guide us, this will require deep study, yeah. discipline, and rigor. We're going to have to unlearn right? As practitioners, healers too, energy, earth, body-based healers that have come through a curative fixed model Mm. analysis that also doesn't serve us well. So how will we be in the service of the work for our people's survival, dignity, and care that does not preempt fixing, curing, right? While we're also relearning and imagining what care is that debunks these mythologies that absolutely devalue our existence. Oh my God. You just, you, you being with you is yes. always an inspiration. You know, no matter, no, no matter what my mindset is going into <laughs> any particular particular form when i see you it is the expression of political love right oh. of love of our people yes um, yes of love of the possibilities that we have of birthing a new world yes and, i'm here for it with you with all yeah. of us yes i just want to thank you so much dear kara um and and in absentia, Erica, for the book too. Yes, yes. My encourage comrade. encourage everybody to get it. And I want to thank you. Edgar Rivera Colon, Doctor of Medical Anthropology, will continue the discussion of health and healing justice from his work as a teacher of medical students, a teacher who honors working class traditions of ancestral knowledge to bring healing to the forefront of medical work today. Good morning, Dr. Edgar Rivera Colon. Um, let me introduce you to the folks that are listening in today. Um, Dr. Colon is a medical anthropologist at the University of Southern California's Keck School of Medicine 
and a course director at Columbia University's Narrative Medicine Certificate of Professional Achievement Program. He teaches courses on uh, health justice and the history of racism in medicine. He hosts the Karl Marx Eight My Field Notes podcast on politics and spirituality. He's the co-author of the award-winning textbook, The Principles and Practices of Narrative Medicine. And he recently published with Patrick Hebert, quote, slow burn, humid pitch, cultivating care while living la COVID a loca. Um, Welcome, Edgar. And before we dive in, I wanted to uh, read a quote from living uh, like La COVID. COVID. Yeah, I know, La COVID I, know. I can't say it like you yeah, say it one time. Say, it's, say a, it's a twist, a queer twist on the Ricky Barton living La Vida Loca. Right? <laughs> um, this is a very, uh, uh, a very powerful piece. And just reading a little, little piece from it to introduce y'all to Edgar, quote, this is from Edgar. I think a lot of us sometimes forget that we come from folks who have a long, vi long term vision. And if you're going to plant something, it takes time. The harvest takes time. How do we tend the garden of time? Because what do we own in this life? All you have to do is get sick. And then you realize, hold up. There's a whole process that needs to go on for me to get well again with a bunch of other people involved. Welcome, Edgar. How are Good you to today? be here? Thank you. And I want to thank uh, you, Vita Valenti, my uh, my great Southern comrade, uh, and also, of course, uh, Trap Bonner, who has invited us into this space. And uh, it's great to be here. And um, yeah, it's interesting. I haven't, you know, I haven't read over that article in a while. So it's a, I wrote that. Uh, so, okay. So, um, no, no. you know, I think that's one thing that we have to keep on thinking about is this question of, like, you know, you know, and, and people like uh, Cara, Cara Page and Erica Woodland mm -hmm. in their book, which mm -hmm. you're part of, mm -hmm. uh, really think about these lineages of healing mm -hmm. justice and this collective process, right? That that part of the, the, I would say, the evil of racial capitalism and settled colonialism in this country, of the many evils, and not even thinking about imperialism, which we will soon, mm -hmm. um, is to convince people they're individuals and nothing beyond that. Right. And I, I think that we have long traditions amongst working people, amongst folks of color, people of the, the New World, uh, African diasporas, mm -hmm. Indigenous folks, LGBTQ folks, I mean, all kinds of folks, uh, gender oppressed people, women, obviously, who have long traditions of care outside of the institutions, right? Outside of what, you know, a lot of young act activists now call the medical industrial complex, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm in the odd position, right, of teaching physicians <laughs> and at the same time reminding them that uh, their call is a call to be a healer. Right. And and that's a science, art and a craft and a science, art and a craft. And that, you know, um, that especially has meaning uh, when we're talking about Puerto Rico and the U.S. South, especially the Gulf Coast South, you know, mm -hmm. sharing these similar histories that include land theft, slavery, settler colonialism, unconsented sterilization and forced displacement. Uh, I know you you have already started to talk about, you know, the impact and the framework of uh, uh, capitalism and its pillar of white supremacy and colonization uh, on our, the impact that that has had on our people's health and the weak to non-existent public health infrastructures that the pandemic laid so bare. And, you know, if you can, you can share, you know, some of your powerful insights on that, that would be. Well, yeah, great. that's right. That's exactly, you know, right on. Um, you're right that in that sense, uh, the pandemic for a lot of people in this country, not for everybody, right? right? Because a lot of folks have been living under regimes of abandonment for a long time. But I think it was the maybe the first time since the Great Depression when people began to realize that people, you know, the folks who run this country, who actually own it, 
mm-hmm. right? Own the means of production, uh, mm-hmm. you know, are in control, the commanding heights of the economy, right? And it's all its institutions and how they vet people who are troublemakers out of those institutions, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I've had that experience myself. Um, <laughs> I think what they've, uh, what folks were able to see was you right. It's revelatory, right? Mm-hmm. It revealed all the contradictions. It, it showed to folks that you know since in the last forty years, as the economy has changed radically, right? Mm-hmm. Folks have been you know folks who were in the industrial economy. We think of General Baker here, we of Jimmy Boggs and Grace Lee Boggs. They were saying already automation is going to change this whole economy, right? And we can see with artificial intelligence. That, that those implications are far off, right? I mean, not that far away, actually. No. So I think that what we're seeing is that folks have been, uh, what's been uh, shown, right, and literally apocalyptic means show, right, is to show the mechanisms that have not worked. And at the core of this, when it comes to healthcare, and you know this as a nurse, that uh, once the 70s came around and the big crisis occurred, right, and we ran out of, we sort of got out of, the elites got out of the strategy of making wealth that they had from the end of World War II, during World War II, to about the 1970s, mm-hmm. they decide to cut and cut and cut because they want to increase their profits. So that's, that's just capitalism, right? Mm-hmm. Increase their profits. And in doing that, they decided to import in a model of political economy or uh, making wealth that was lean and flexible. What did that mean for hospitals? That meant staffs were cut, uh, you know, uh, resources were cut and beds were cut. So when the pandemic came, we neither had the staffing nor the beds, nor the equipment. The richest country in society in the history of the planet didn't have ventilators, Mm -hmm. right? didn't have sufficient uh, personal protective equipment, right? Mm-hmm. So all these things point to those accumulation strategies. I, I think our, our comrade Brad Wallace always says that the elites in this country are in their uh, cash out phase of their accumulation process. So what does that mean about health? That means that the preventive health that a good healthcare system would have is not there. Right. right. Uh, the departments of public health are underfunded. Mm-hmm. Uh, at all levels of, of, of government. And also the, the other piece that's, that's really tragic is that when you do that, you're doing a triage where you decide there are populations that can die. That's right. right. That's Elders right. can die, right? Uh, people with disabilities can die. Immune compromised people, which is a big group in this society, large group in society, uh, disability, you know? And if you live long enough in this country, you can be disabled. Right. Given, given the kind of health care we have, unfortunately, very few people uh, grow old without becoming disabled. Right. And we see this, this conjuncture of elders, disabled folks, immune compromised folks, and, and all the kind of what they call morbidities, di- amongst our folks, especially diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, what they call metabolic syndrome. Right. And a lot of that is about the food system we have. Right. So we now we go back to the land. Right. Free the land. Right. And the land becomes an issue because we're doing the industrial agriculture. Right. right? That, that, you know, basically creates a food system that is unhealthy and susceptible, very much susceptible to the introduction of new uh, viruses. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we're watching right now. uh, There was a. I, I don't know what country now is listening to news today. There is a an emergency going on with the flu, avian flu. I think it might be England or Canada. I'm not sure. I'd have to check that. But basically, it's the uh, the H5N1 uh, mm-hmm. virus that we have to worry about going into human populations. So what we see is uh, healthcare for profit, which uh, people have been saying for long. And, and the scandal of it all, really, the, the heart of the scandal is... In, in a country with so much wealth, really accumulated wealth in private hands, largely, um, there's no national health insurance. Right. Right. So what? how does that come down to the concrete? In my case, it's my mother dying in Puerto Rico in a colonial hospital, right? And, and I'll just give you to just be concrete with folks. So my mom mm-hmm. had Alzheimer's. 
Um, you know, the landlord sold the building she was in to make money, right? And so we we sent her to Portugal. I was staying with her. I was the person caring for her for those years when she had Alzheimer's, along with my my sister and my sister-in-law and my cousin. It was a community effort, uh, people in the neighborhood, right? And so once she left, she went to Puerto Rico and she she had some kind of wounds on her feet, but it wasn't in any way deadly. Mm. Uh, but she went to a colonial hospital and we sort of knew that once she went to that hospital, there were no vaccines at that time, that that would be the end. Right. And that's exactly what happened. She died in the hospital. Mm. And my RTT, who was like the matriarch of her family, same thing. She went to the hospital, came back, had COVID, passed away. Right. Mm. So these, these are hard, but my, this story, our families has been rec- replicated hundreds That's of right. thousands and millions of times That's on a national and global level. Right? That's right. So that means really that they were abandoned. That's right? Right. And in, it's more intense in Puerto Rico precisely because it is a colonial situation. So the United States, you know, in Puerto Rico, you have to always like fight with folks about, you know, no, yeah, right. Is Puerto Rico part of the United States. <laughs> right. You have to fight with folks about that, but you know, actually, if you look at the economics of Puerto Rico, the United States invests $17 million of its government funds in Puerto Rico. It gets back $51 million in terms of investment. So actually, I'm, I'm, I'm actually getting it wrong. $17 billion, it tr- extracts $51 billion wow. on a yearly basis, right? So, so when you look at that, right, it's not a question of resources, right? And, and this is the, the question of revolutionaries for a long time in this country. And I've always said this, you know, and you're, you've been in this struggle longer than I have, Rita, and we are to redistribute this wealth and put it in the hands of the folks who create the wealth, the real, the workers, the ordinary folks, or this thing is going to kill us all, right? Yes. And, you know, and, that, and that's, that's where we're at, right? Like the health crisis is part of a broader institutional crisis, right? And we can think about it in various ways. And one way to think about it is this simply... You know, um, what I tell my students, which is like, you know, look, you come to me, you say, wow, we go into the clinics and we see that people don't have what they need. Like, how can we give them prescriptions? The basic they can't necessities, fill it. right? Yeah, yeah, they can't. How, how can we ask them to go to this clinic if, if they only rely on buses and buses in L.A. is like a penance, right? In the sense, you have to wait. Right? It's like Lent, right? You know, you have to sort of Atlanta too, you know? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, right. All these cities that, and we know, right, as people who know our history, working class history, that that was a decision by corporations to destroy all those light rails and trolleys in order to make sure that people were car dependent and we were building highways. That's that really was what it what that was all about, really. And so, um, I, I'll say to my students, I'll say, look, uh, you're seeing the irrationality right, of the system. It's incoherence, frontline, right? Institutionally, the way that we're, they're educated, the crazy sense of medicine that, you know, you can't do anything wrong because then you're attending, well, write a recommendation so you can go to your, you know, your next thing, your phase, of, you know, and, and all that's medieval stuff. I mean, really, but, but at the core of it, the students feel surveilled themselves. They see the contradictions. And I say, okay, that's true. This is, what you're having, you're looking at clinically, right? And you have to remember this as a doctor, right? But the other piece is this, it's a symptom, right? Pull back, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the broad panorama. Why is healthcare in this state of affairs? There were choices made at the policy level, economic and political, right? That led to the kind of fragile, vulnerable system we have. And the people who pay out on that are the ordinary folks. Where healthcare at, at one point during uh, the booming, the very short term, <laughs> right. you term, have to remind the, people of that, right? The scope of human history, right? Mm-hmm. The very short term booming of industrialization, where the role of healthcare was to ensure a productive uh, working class capable of reproducing itself. And then as the changes happen, to the economy, healthcare no longer becomes that, no longer plays that role, but becomes a, a valuable commodity for certain, you know, huge corporations in and of itself. So when a pandemic hits, right, 
when, when uh, and and as you said, uh, many people, uh, particularly Black, Latinx, people of color in the working class have been experiencing forever this inequality, this lack of access. Um, and, and we saw in particular during the pandemic, this oxymoron between a worker being essential and disposable at right. the same time, right? So, yeah. And this is the point of analysis, right? right? How is it that this system produces that contradiction? Right, right. And and we can think about there are different places. I was in New York uh, for most, a good chunk of the pandemic anyway. And I'm thinking of Queens Hospital, mm. a public hospital in, in Queens. Uh, and that was one of the epicenters of of the of the virus again this is before vaccines mm -hmm. and people were dying at home mm -hmm. not being able to were just being picked up basically by the ambulances uh people die and who were those people well queens is the most ethnically and religiously diverse borough in new york city there are like something like a hundred different languages spoken in queens it was the multiracial, largely immigrant, working class people who do all the service economy. That's right. Mexicans, Colombians, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, Indians, Africans, all, I mean, all kinds of folks, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you saw in, in Queens, where I always say that, that, you know, Queens is one of these boroughs where you see global contradictions at the same time that you see local contradictions, right? Mm -hmm. And these were the essential workers. These were the people who could not survive if they did not show up to work and had to show up for other people to survive. That's right, that's right. And so it was that piece that we, 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 we it sobered our senses, right? It's like Marx says, you know, this, the sober ice cold notions of class or, or cash, right? That that's the real, uh, you know, sort of what we're dealing with. Um, and so there were splits within sort of the elites in this country. People wanted to do a little bit more, people who didn't want to do anything, people who were in complete denial, right? right. And I think one of the things that has challenged us as a movement is to, and here we're thinking about our broad movement of social justice and health justice, right? Um, and healing justice, to use that term, um, is how do we uh, build a movement in this space of fear, right? We have to build trust again with folks, right? And, and you know that it's about relationships, about connecting with folks, with understanding that people are self-organized. So one of the, the lessons I learned was how powerfully people can engage in mutual aid. And those, and those are traditions that already preexisted and people mobilized. But there were a lot of young folks for the first time had done the mutual aid piece, right? So I think, I think that's a light for us. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, let, let's go there. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what we've already described is sort of the uh, healthcare structures and institutions that are not only inadequate, but are literally killing us. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that some of the work that you do, particularly with narrative medicine, you know, begins to get to the point of how do we move from fear and panic to flourish and thriving, uh, how is it, uh, you know, how is it that uh, love is the most important form of political labor, uh, which I've I've heard you speak of before? And how do we begin to, you know, engage in these conversations about the vision that's necessary and what's happening on the ground? So, yeah, please share share that, you know, because as as we experience crisis, as we begin to recognize that the problem is not scarcity, it's the distribution of abundance, right? Uh, how can we begin to converge and, and, and begin this process of creating within the shell of this corroding system something new uh, right. that also challenges the existing class relationships that you talk about? Yeah, yeah. And we know that when we talk about class relationships in the United States, it's racialized. It's always racialized. Right. Right. It's gendered, right? right. It's, right. It's, it's, you know, there is a body that's worthy of survival. And you know what that body looks like, yeah. right? <laughs> it's bourgeois, it's white, it's male, it's, it's not right, us. Straight, <laughs> right, right, right. It's George Bush. Right? Right. Right. And so, um, so I think that you're right that this, this, this moment, first of all, to be 
of revolutionaries to understand that the future is in the present. Right. 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 And that the past is lively. Right. The past is not dead. You know. And we we know from from Marx and other sources. We know from our ancestral traditions. Right. Mm -hmm. That in fact, um, you know, human beings, right, create history, but not under the conditions of their choosing. Right. And but there is choice, <laughs> and there is space. And in narrative medicine, I'll just tell you quickly the story of narrative medicine. How did it develop? Basically, a, do a couple of doctors, a couple of literary people, philosoph a philosopher. They threw in a the philosopher, social scientist. They just started realizing that all these healthcare workers were burnt out. Right. And, and then they started to realize, oh, this is the corporate form, this kind of health care, as opposed to post-World War II health care, which was a little bit more social democratic. There was more space, right? New programs were made during the Great Society, right? Mm -hmm. But um, they realized that uh, we need to do something. And narrative medicine developed in order to centralize the stories of patients to get healthcare workers, I uh, started with physicians, it's way broader now, uh, to listen in a way that's active, in a way that's vulnerable, in a way that subverts the logic of time compression of capitalist medicine. Right? I, t I tell my colleagues in the institutions all the time, you know, you know you're having a problem and you need to study some politics or something or economics when you have internalized the logic of scarcity right. and the frenzy of work that the institution mm -hmm. wants you to get into. One of the paradoxes of crisis is that you have to slow down if you really want to confront it, right? Then that's what narrow medicine, just slowing down, right? And, and these traditions of resistance, revolutionary traditions, uh, revolutionary black nationalist traditions, the Puerto Rican nationalist tradition, all these uh, the Marxist tradition, all these socialist and anarchist traditions, communist tradition, all these traditions emphasize education and collective development precisely because they're trying to get out of that time frame of capitalism, right? The time frame of you have to do this 12 hours. I mean, I just had a conversation with a uh, this, the, the husband of a colleague. He's like 69 years old. He's putting 12 hours a day. And I said to him, I, I, you, you can't do that. And he, and he knew he couldn't do it. He's a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. So they had to hire somebody else. He said, I hope I'm not going to have to, you know, continue this pattern. But this guy is 60. He's been practicing for 40 years. Right. And he just said to me, it just got worse. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, right. And this is a, 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 a pretty well healed doctor talking. Right. And so what I'm, what I really want to emphasize is this notion of collectivity and collective development, right. That what pushes us ultimately is the sense of love that, that freedom is deeply entangled in love and romantic love is beautiful. Right. But this is broader than that. <laughs> this is the love of a people, uh, the love of our folks, right? Uh, the care that we got and that we move forward. Mm -hmm. It's uh, what some people call activist mothering, activist nurturing, right? And so we're creating these circles of light, circles of both resistance, but of creating space for people to restore themselves, right? There's a wonderful term that comes out of the Latin American mm -hmm. tradition of revolution that's called replegue the tactical retreat, right? Mm -hmm. That our folks have learned to have tactical retreats. They could be in other traditions, they're called hush arbors. Uh, Toni Morrison calls it the clearing in Beloved, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when Baby Show preaches in the woods, there's a great scene there. Uh, Palenque, right, in the Caribbean. Quilombo, right, Maroonage. Mm. <laughs> all these traditions, right, all these traditions are about gathering and talking, healing, and then the work, right? So it has to be a dialectic, right? The work of constant struggle, of liberation, plus the work of self-care, collective care, right? So it, I'll give you a sample. You know, I grew up in a working class neighborhood in Jersey City, an industrial city. I literally, you know, just to show you what happened in the ties bed. So I was, I grew up mostly on Wayne Street, and there was a, a pencil factory two blocks from my house. My uncle worked there. 
Uh, you remember the number two pencils that you take on? Of tests course. You had yeah, to yeah, mark, yeah, yeah. you had to circle, yeah. fill yeah, in the so, circle only with a number two pencil. That's right. right. Only with a number two pencils, right? And so the Dixon Ticonderoga factory was literally three blocks from my house. That's and my right, uncle dude. worked there, you know. And so I grew up in this, and there were other, like, if you go further down to the city at that time, the Colgate Palmolive Company was there, and there were workers there, and it smelled like soap in the winter and then dead fish in the summer. So, we <laughs> so, you know, I grew up in that environment. It was Puerto Rican, Black, there were some Cubans, Dominicans, and there were like old white ethnics who had never left, you know, who had right. never left, like Italians and yeah. Polish folks, working class all of them. Yeah. And um, that, that growing up, right, in that working class environment, I was m taken care of by my neighborhood, by my, and I'm not going to be romantic, it was tough. Right. Be romantic about this, right? These people were oppressed, right? The yeah. cops were not nice, right? And so, um, and the landlords were jerks, right? right. So, um, but, uh, you know, I clearly had many mothers, many fathers, right? Uh, many elders, right? And I think that those traditions, that's the way we survive. That's right. And it could be like, Running numbers to see if you hit that number, right? I mean, let's, let's be clear, right? You I'm know, the numbers in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> I had a dream last night where Bob was like, play, let's play that number. You no, know, that's but, right. Right? Yeah, the, the bookie would come every Saturday, though, like, right? <laughs> Drop by, have a cup of coffee. So, what, what I'm saying is that these kinds of traditions of resistance mm -hmm. are deep in our folks. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? We may have to have a new language to explain a new situation. Yeah, that's true, right? But we do that collectively, right? And I think I think the thing that that um you know the labor of love, right, is has a many aspects to it. One of them is remembering who we are. That's right. Right, right. Fully remembering who we are and where we came from. But the other thing is recreating the possibility of other selves and other worlds, right? And and the great thing about the Marxist tradition is that we we know dialectically <laughs> that the co-presence of time is with us all the time, past, present, and future, right? And that we are in our work, in our revolutionary work, in our reform work, in our radical work, we're engaging in workshops of the future with the materials of the past and the present. Right? I've yeah. No, I, I, don't, I don't mean to stop you. I mean, I absolutely love this. Um, and particularly, you know, what you were saying about uh, sort of a, a, a tactical step back, a tactical retreat to engage in those collective memories, to engage in what we know humanity has had this impulse toward forever. Right, this impulse that has been uh, squeezed and attempted to be crushed um, by the by these property relations that we that we see, and thinking, Edgar, you know, as we begin to sort of wind up this one piece of this beautiful series, the public uh, health pulse, that this this tactical gathering with a purpose for a strategic offensive. Right. That's right. To make the world we want. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. And 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 the, the the interesting thing about it, right, to me at least as a as I mean I'm a social scientist, right? So these things are just me, um is how nonlinear it is and how that's powerful right. it is to not think linearly in the sense of capitalism is basically a, a system that suppresses time, right? And alter space. Right. Right? That's 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 the way they and they call it creative. Marx called it like, like, creative destruction, right? But mm -hmm. it's we have a different logic. That's right. right. And our traditions have a different logic, right? Where we can slow down and do the healing we need. I'm so happy that the that the younger generation, you know, folks who are younger than me, at least in the 40s, 50s, uh, 30s, 20s, they're getting the the whole like historical trauma piece, the healing piece, the storytelling piece. Uh, the collectivity piece, the mutual aid piece, right on. Right. right. They're experimenting, they're learning, and they're gathering their, their information and thinking through this, right? 
Um, we haven't done the best job, the older generation, of creating institutions from which they can be formed politically, spiritually, cooperatively, economically. We haven't done the best job. I sort of have. Right? Right. Yeah, right. So we have to be sober, right, in our assessments. But at the same time, what I see that I haven't seen in a long time in the U.S. is people are talking yeah. socialism, yeah. talking collectivities, right. talking cooperation, as opposed to the, the sort of constant dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world, the logic, uh, the rapaciousness of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And we know, you know, those of us who are rooted in, I mean, I come out of the liberation theology movement, uh, you know, and uh, I, I guess I'm a Christian Marxist. Um, we, we know from our own analysis and from our own experience that this system has democratic elements mm -hmm. as a way of containing the impulses of ordinary people so they can, you know, have some level of expression politically, but they will cannibalize that and get rid of it under, under a set of conditions, right? That fascism, like when people say to me, oh, the Germans, they're beyond fat. No, they did. I mean, we, we, we're not beyond slavery. In Germany, what happened was some Nazis, most of the Nazis were caught, right? <laughs> and they became part of West Germany and the U.S. intelligence services, right? <laughs> yeah, so right. I mean, really, that's what happened, right? So I think what we should consider is that uh, the settler colonial state with its imperialist military apparatus, and right now the enemy is China, apparently. Um, you know, it was, it was the Russians not too long ago, right? It was, quote unquote, Islamic fascists, right? You know, that that entity is happy to destroy the democratic spaces that folks have created. They haven't given it to us. We've, we've fought for all that when we think about them, things like that. So I think we, we are in a period where we should attend to what these people are up to, understand how they mobilize and build our infrastructure for mobilization, right? Build our structure for mobilization because um, sometimes surviving is the most revolutionary thing you can do. <laughs> and I think that people are getting that. They're getting that. And, they, and it's multi-layered, the kind of survival that we need. And the kind of flourishing that I certainly believe in, that you believe in, that the what it is to be human is to create to labor the world and ourselves that we can imagine with our co-species and uh, on uh, in a sustainable way. I, I, Edgar, we could go on and I could certainly go on with you for hours more um, <laughs> and explore the, the role of the labor of love in this process of building the infrastructures and for the first time in human history, actually having the capacity to become fully that's, human, that's to right. heal the earth, to heal ourselves, to heal our people. And I, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart so much for your participation in this wonderful series um, for bridging healing and health justice, how they go together, and um, thanking you so much for being a well, part of this today. Well, thank you. This was this is a wonderful time to discuss. And of course, with, with you, you, you and me, Rita, to be continued, right? That's right. Always. <laughs> right? Always. All Always. CDC, all the other stuff we Always. collaborate with.